My people, my people, we're ready for mount up like a eagle. Stand and fight against evil. A system rigged and deceitful. What's good? It's your boy Sean Slaughter. Welcome to the King Talks Podcast, where we're all about the truth, community, and discussing the things you care about. On today's show, we're going to interview Jason Wilson, who authored the book, Cry Like a Man, Fighting for Freedom from Emotional Incarceration. This book is simply amazing. Jason goes through his life, lots of trauma, lots of death, lots of highs, lots of lows, abandonment by his father, just interesting stories. So without further ado, let's get it in. My people, my people, we're ready to mount up like a eagle. Stand and fight against evil. A system rigged and deceitful. King, you can hear it when I rhyme, I'm a king. Renewed in my mind, I'm a king. I got a different bloodline, I'm a king. Jump, jump, I am a king, I'm a king. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, today we're going to be interviewing Jason Wilson, and uh, we're going to talk to Jason about his book, Cry Like a Man. Jason, how you doing today, man? Yeah, how you doing, Sean? Doing well, brother. I'm doing very, very, very well. Now, I have a, um, and, and we'll get into to the couple of little surprises <laughs> I want to I want to say for for some of the listeners, <laughs> yeah. but but I, I I have to be honest. So, <clears throat> um. I like reading books, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I'm frustrated with books because mm. books have so much fluff um, in books. They have great information. So I, I finished reading a book called Grit by Angela Duckworth. Great book. Mm-hmm. Um, but so much fluff, man. I mean, you know, they give me the remedy. They give me the, the points. They give me certain things they, they, they tell me about. And then they hammer it in over and over. And, and by the third chapter, I'm like, okay, let's move to the next point. Your book, I loved. Um, from the first chapter to the second chapter, stories, the points you make, um, it was concise. You didn't beat a horse to death. Um, it, it really read like it read like a movie. I mean, it, it read like a TV show. Was that something mm-hmm. that you were aiming for in writing this book? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, um, the writer who helped me with it, she's actually a screenwriter. <laughs> and her name is, her name is Kimberly. And um, what was amazing about working with her, just for us just learning, um, you know, everyone thinks they can write a book, you know, but really learning how a book is written, but more so understanding the structure it takes to write a book like a movie script. And um, that that was very strategic because I'm like you, my brother. It's like, you know, I didn't want uh, my book to be another self-help book for men. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been sermonized to death. I've, I'm tired of hearing the five steps to such and such, the 10 steps to this, this and that. You know, I just needed some, I wanted people to understand that just because something is wrong with you doesn't mean something is wrong with you. You know, uh, our God uses adversity to make us stronger. But if we can't express how we're feeling, there's no way on earth we will ever get out of an adverse mind state, um, a mindset pretty much. And so I wanted it. I wanted a, a person to pick this book up and to be so engulfed with what's going on, the transparency, uh, the heartache, but yet the triumphs, the trials, the tests, the, the love and, and, and to close the book feeling empowered to be a human. Awesome. Awesome, man. Um, well, I must have hit it right in the nail, man. I must be a prophet. So, um, all right, cool. <laughs> so, I, you know, I've been, you know, I've been, I've known you for years. So, well, well, look, um, well, 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 don't, don't go yeah. there yet. Don't go there yet. Okay. We're, we're going to save, we're going to save that because I, I, because when I got to kind of the final chapters and I'm like the union, all right, but I, I ain't going to, I'm not even going to get to that yet. All right, we're going to save right, that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so anyway, um, let's jump into the book. And, and, and really what I want to do is give the listeners kind of a picture of some of the things that the book talks about and really just encourage you guys to go out and pick this book up. Uh, it is a fantastic uh, book for men. And, uh, again, like Jason says, I love it because it didn't give me five steps and 12 steps. 
it just told me his story and every chapter made me think. You start the book off with the lynching of your grandfather, Estes Wright, um, which, yeah. you know, was kind of shocking right off the bat. Why was this important to begin your story with the lynching of your grandfather? Well, Sean, I mean, you know, um, growing up with a mother um, who was traumatized, not only by that event, but other events that passed, uh, that happened after that, um, I saw the effects of not being able to release trauma. And so I wanted to trace it back to where it all began. And it, and it happened with my grandfather and then his children, my uncles and aunties, not really knowing what happened until later in their lives. And I saw that manifest in unresolved anger, hate, uh, depression, um, anxiety. And um, it was just very important for me, especially as an African-American, to um, um, shed light on the trauma. Um, this actually has been diagnosed post-traumatic slavery syndrome, and we don't understand what has happened to us in our past. If we're not healed from it, it continues and will always affect us in the future. So it was very important that I, I start there. Um, and then also, you know, tell the story of what I believe a lot of uh, my radical love for Christ stems from was my grandfather, the, his, his hatred for evil and injustice. And that's what ended up causing him to lose his life. And there's many, you know, uh, uh, my great uncle, uh, James Hare, who was one of the first uh, black Navy men, the Golden 13, he wrote about it in the book called The Golden 13, saying my grandfather was lynched. And then I hear from my uncle, that we don't really know, but we do know that he was beaten so bad that his head was soft as cotton by the police. And so at the end of the day, to uh, trace back why, what there's, as the, you know, the reader reads my book there, see why my mother struggled with so much hate and then fear and worrying. And then, but when you trace it back to that moment, that's where it all started. And you know, many of my family believe that the reason the majority of our uncles and, uh, had dementia and auntie, aunties is because they could not let go of that tra traumatic past. Can, can you talk about that? You mentioned post-traumatic slavery syndrome, and, and I've, I've mentioned that before um, in conversations with, with, with um, you know, just some brothers and things like that. And, and, and you're basically saying that post-traumatic slavery syndrome you mentioned your grandfather because even though you were not there, it still had an effect on you and your family. Can you flesh that out just a little bit for our listeners? Well, it's, it's interesting. You know, I'm not uh, the best at, you know, breaking this down, but I go to, you know, I'm real big with mental health for, for men, especially because it's a, this, uh, it's a negative, uh, uh, it's a stigma that associates men going to see uh, a mental health professional like we're weak. But, you know, so I always say, you know, you know, just because something is wrong with you doesn't necessarily mean something is wrong with you. So what I've learned from just uh, Dr. Tim Bro, who's actually my counselor, he told me that it's, it's it becomes a part of your DNA when it goes from generation to generation. The, the remembering the pain, the drama, the trauma that has happened that results into other. He says trauma will result into drama. And so from my family getting ostracized ostracized from their community because the other black people around them were scared that the same thing would happen to them. That is trauma. Growing up as a little four-year-old girl and now all of your friends don't want to talk to you. And so that is carried on through generations. And then I see it from my mother worrying, uh, smoking, trying to fight smoking because my brother was killed. And, and it goes on and on and on. And now it's not really, you know, a lot of times doctors will say, you know, you're, um, your blood pressure is, is hereditary, you know, high blood pressure. And I love this one saying, it says, the reason uh, diabetes runs in your family is because no one runs in your family. <laughs> and so, if we, so you know, so no if we're not taking proactive steps <laughs> no doubt. to resolve and release the trauma that we've experienced, even the kids of our generation, Sean, who hear gunshots daily, that's trauma. And then we wonder why they can't sit still in class and exude ADHD symptoms Studies have proven that uh, the majority of kids who exude ADHD symptoms in our communities is a result of trauma. And so that's why, you know, the Cape of Adelum is so successful with boys who exude ADHD symptoms. We don't give medication out. We give them an opportunity to express why they're shaking, why they can't sit still, why they can't stay focused. 
And then next thing you know, the grade point average improved one letter grade in 16 weeks without tutoring because we've allowed them to basically, I hate, you know, it's the same to break the generational curse, but I'm just trying to get them to break staying in a traumatized mindset. Yes, yes. Well, speaking about trauma and speaking about trauma and drama in poor communities, um, your, you had two brothers and um, they were uh, fathered by um, Sinclair Sr., who um, he left before you were born. And um, your father, Oliver, uh, you know, was in your life for, for a while, and, and then he left as well. W- what affects, and, and, and this is common, you know, um, you know, in black communities, especially poor black communities where there are men coming in and out. There are, um, you know, several kids who are fathered by different men within the household. What did Sinclair seniors um effect he wasn't your dad but also oliver your dad how did they how did their affect um or, or how did they affect your idea of manhood or, or what you, or, or really what you thought a father mm-hmm. was that's that's really good man you know well just first if sinclair senior didn't leave my mother had to leave him because he would beat her senses senselessly Often, you know, um, he actually slapped my brother with the flat slide, flat sides of butcher knives. Uh, you know, so I saw the direct effect. So imagine a woman coming out of losing her father to a horrific death, then to marry the man that she thought, thought was a godsend, ending up being hell on earth. And then my brother's just be in the house where a man would come home drunk and angry, would shoot a shotgun in the house. So I saw the effects of it on my brothers. Well, my brother, because my other brother died when I was so young, it's hard to remember. But my brother Sinclair, when I, I saw him having to get on medications for depression and stress and anxiety because of all that he experienced. And then my father, you know, I just found out as I was writing the book that he slapped a mother. And she actually, even though he had committed adultery, which sparked her seeking a divorce, But it was that hand slap to her face that says, I can't go through that again. And so my perception of a man at that point in my life was that you don't have commitment to anything but what you want to do. And so I never had faith in men growing up. I remember so many men, uh, just a recent mentor of mine died who was a manager of mine in music. I was crying at the funeral because, you know, I got to take you back and recall the things that he placed in your life, how he was there. This man would seek me out intentionally but because of my father wound and the disappointment of other men in my lives I'm like what do you want from me no man can care about me to really want to help me so what do you want from me and so that's what the, yeah and that's what happens to a lot of our black boys who are being like right now we have an abundance of mentors in our communities but a lot of them are scared to accept it because they're being hurt by their own fathers so how can they really trust a man who really they didn't come from and so that's what I grew up with. It's just, it's, it started, you know, like I was, I had selective memory. I was putting these hurtful moments aside. The next thing you know, I started becoming what I resented. Wow. Now, now to, to kind of talk about that a little bit, I, I'm an educator. I, I teach at um, an alternative school. And, um, and unfortunately, um, I would say 95% of the kids, these are kids that get kicked out of school, have community charges, yeah. Um, all that type stuff. And unfortunately, 95% of those kids um, are young black men. And just exactly what you said, uh, where you're trying to connect to a young man and, um, you know, many times, uh, you know, that young man can't even receive uh, love. Does he know what love is? Mm-hmm. Um, and um, in all reality, I'm like a dinosaur to him. Because I'm a I'm a black man that, um, you know, I I can speak slang, but I speak well. Uh, uh, I'm I'm intelligent. Um, I know the rap music that he listens to, but I also know a whole bunch of other stuff and a whole bunch of other music and and, and things like that. And I'm almost I'm almost like a dinosaur. How do you I I know you have an organization. We'll talk about, you know, the Kata. Um, is, is is that something that you try to do within your organization to to reach young men? And and how do you do that? How do you how can you break through that? Well, you know, um, 
like I always go back to a conversation my son had with me one day in the basement. We were training. He looked at me, you know, really serious. And he says, Dad, you know, like he was very appreciative. He says, Dad, how did you become a great dad when your father wasn't? And I looked at him. I said, you know, son, I simply gave you what I longed for. And so and so what I do with all of the boys that come that God crosses my path with, I give them all what I longed for. I even give men and fathers who are broken. I give them what I longed for. Another man, an older man who they could come to cry to and share their concerns, their failures and their fears with and but still leave empowered. And so um, for me, it's it's you know, you're not um, I forgot the word you use. You're not a, a dinosaur. dinosaur. <laughs> you, you're you're to, an illusion. You're again. an illusion in it. You're an mm. illusion. Okay. Wow. It's like you can't be real. They, they they put their hand to touch you and they go straight through you. Like no, you can't be real. Where where's I know you got three or four girls on the side. I know you you know you do this. I know you get high all the time. Right, I know you, you're not right. really going to be committed to your family. I know you're probably an activist in the community, but scared to get married. Which you don't understand. If you can't have a marriage, how you going to save the community? You can't have a family. How you going to change the community? So yeah, you're just about talk. I get it. And and so the only way I'm able to shed that. And I know the way I tell Sean I've broken ground is when I tell them I love them and they say, I love you. And any man who is pouring into a boy, if, if when you say you love them and they can't say they love you back, you got a lot of work to do. And so and, and that's that's how I, I, I make sure and I have a lot of recruits and it, it keeps me humble. I say, I love you, son. They say, thank you. You know, they won't say I love you yet because they need to see it. They need to feel it. And like, you know, uh, Yeshua, Christ said it the best. He says, you know, even though he was frustrated a little in the moment, he says, you know, you will not believe unless you see signs and wonders. But it was a truth there. You know, our sons need to see the signs of what it means to be a comprehensive man. You know, um, I, 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 you know, when I really looked up the word masculinity and when I found out that it simply means like having qualities traditionally ascribed to a man, as strength and boldness, I said, but those aren't qualities attributed to being a human, though. What about compassionate, loving, you know, caring? You know, we're humans. And so we've allowed this one word to define how vast and comprehensive we've been created to be. And because of that, we are run and leave our families because we're feeling an emotion that is countercultural to what we've told who what we've been told we are. So if I just lost my job, I just got married, I'm feeling pressure. I, I gotta abort. You know why? Because I'm feeling scared, so I'm leaving the crib. But that emotion you're feeling is real. You just need to go to a safe space where you can talk to some other comprehensive men and say, hey, the way you feel is normal, but we can't let that emotion master you. And so, and that's what men need. Men need to say, okay. The way you're feeling is fine. It's an emotion. But is that do you need to keep or cast that emotion? You know, I wish so many of my friends I lost to gun violence would have entertained the emotion of fear. So when I first heard the song uh, Never Scared by Bone Crush, which was a hard track, if you got a man who's never scared, he's going to die soon. You know, I can't tell you how many situations, Sean, I've been in where guns have been on my head. Literally, I felt the cold still of a gun. And I had to operate in, you will say it's fear. I say it's wisdom. So that I'm, because I'm here today, but you can't even get to wisdom if you shun fear. You know, and so God says for us not to fear, but that's a different context than being involved in something that's dangerous. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think the most, we realize that sometimes the most diff, the most, um, Dangerous people are those that have nothing to live for, where they, <laughs> quote unquote, they are never scared. They lose that fear um, mm-hmm. and, and they become desensitized to, to anything that's around them. So um, that's, that's very true. That's good point, man. It's very true. That's good point. Um, your mom, she she suffered from anxiety and depression. Um, mm-hmm. What were her coping mechanisms and, and how do those mechanisms affect the family? Man, you know, I don't even know if she had any coping mechanisms after going through what she went through as a child and then the first marriage and then losing my brother. Um, 
the way uh, we all did. Um, she literally is about to lose her mind at that stage in her life. If it wasn't for our community um, of friends and, and family, um, my mother probably wouldn't even be here, man. You know, um, so I don't know if she had a coping mechanism. Um, my mother learned how to, uh, she was a functioning warrior. You know, she knew how to, uh, live with a traumatized mind. She knew how to live life worrying about what was to happen the next moment because she didn't know when you had a volatile husband or your son just didn't come home in the morning. And so she didn't, I don't, I don't believe brother, she had a coping mechanism, but if I was to say it was one thing, it was her faith in in the Lord, man. Um, so she did have I, she did I, have I, faith in the Lord. Oh, for sure, man. It was so. I mean, going back, my my grandfather was a Christian. He was a believer. That's what prompted his hatred against evil. You know, and and my grandmother as well. But it's interesting, Sean. It wasn't until later in my life where uh, I walked my mother through just the salvation process because she says, Jason, I'm tired of being unhappy. And this when she was in the hospital, maybe her fourth year after having dementia. I said, what do you mean? I said, you, you know, she says, I need to know who Jesus is for real. I said, well, wait a minute, I know you're a believer. She says, I think I am. I know he's real, but I don't think I ever trusted him. And so that moment, I videotaped that moment and I'm going to share it one day with the public. But in that hospital room, she surrendered her life to Christ in that moment. And what was deep, you know, one thing about dementia, what I learned from caring for her and what, what the Most High showed me, he said, it, it wasn't until, Sean, it wasn't until my mother was able to forget was she, was she able to find peace. And so then I think about what Paul says about not, not being so caught up with the things in the past, but pressing forward and how we're supposed to think on those things that are good. And so... I said, wow, whoa, that's an answer to so much, especially with trauma. You know, I, I the, the things I prayed to be broken in 2009 because I was a stubborn vessel. And I knew the only way I could be used by him to this point is for God to gracefully break me. And, what you know, so with, with that being said, I, I, I um, it, it's she she had faith in him. But she had allowed her her test in adverse situations. She thought that she was supposed to live a life there. And that's what happens with a person who is stuck in trauma, fight or flight, where you feel that is your life. When God didn't mean for uh, the, the, the test that he put you through wasn't meant for you to stay in it. It was meant for you to pass and move on. And as a people, you know, that's why I titled one of the tra- chapters, Trauma is Not the Black Experience. Because I'm tired of our people wearing trauma like a badge of honor. And, you know, if, you know, I want the most high to use me and to shed light and truly, you know, what I believe is the deception of the evil one to keep us in a a mental and emotional bondage. You know, man, that is that is such a powerful statement. You know, when you watch um, when you watch rap videos and, um, you know, people say, uh, you know, why did why are they doing this? And there's guns in the video and choppers and drugs and, and so on and so mm-hmm. forth. And I, and I always say, I say, you know, when you have a people who's had their identity stripped from them. All right. Mm-hmm. So so mm-hmm. so so when they look back, you know, when 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 um, when when an Asian American looks back and their and their last name, you know, might be Ming or Wong or something like that. And they can connect mm-hmm. to an Asian experience in Asia somewhere or 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 when. A, a, an Irish person looks back and their last name has that, you know, that that Irish flair to it or, or, or that Spanish person looks back and Rodriguez and they can connect to so on and so forth. When a when a black person looks back, you know, their last name typically came from a slave owner and right. they can't connect um, necessarily to an African experience because uh, our records were destroyed and and it's hard mm-hmm. to now it's hard to, to connect to, to those lineages. And so as an African-American what you just said, we take on trauma as our identity because we feel like that's our starting point. And so when yes, you sir. when you see a rapper rapping, he's rapping his what he feels just like what you said. He feels what the black experience. See the 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 Scottish experience, the Asian experience, 
the, the Dominican or Puerto Rican experience, you can, you can never find, um, uh, or it's difficult to find another culture's experience where they start in trauma, you know? Uh, <laughs> but for us, you know, for, for, for us, you know, and, and we got to do a little more digging, to, you know, to, to find out where, where, where we were kings and royalty and things like that. But unfortunately, we start on the plantation. We start with families being torn apart. We start with our men being beat. We start with our women being raped. And, and that becomes our identity. Therefore, now we have rap videos where the hardest, the one that, you know, kids in my classroom, yeah, man, you know, I did. You know, I did so and so in juvie, and now and now everybody wants to one up each other on what they saw in juvie, what they did in juvie, mm-hmm. who saw this mm-hmm. fight. It's a powerful, powerful statement you just made, man. And it's, mm-hmm. it's um, I, I I think I think for our community, it's something that we're gonna have to work very very hard to overcome because it's it's really now within the fabric of uh, of black culture. It is, you know. I remember I went to one. Uh, juvenile detention center, uh, I believe it was in Louisville, Kentucky, um, and or it may have been in Baltimore. I can't remember right now, but when I went in, man, uh, my eyes became overwhelmed, like just flooded with tears. And as I was speaking to the young men, I, I, I asked them, I said, can you name just one, one person in here who is not in here, in here, due to a lack of emotional stability. Was your decision that got you in here, was it rooted because you lost control of your emotions? And they all looked at me. I said, it's because you're told that you can't be emotional. So if, you, if, 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 a, if, a, if a boy... <laughs> so this is interesting. So like with me growing up, I, I, had, I never was no thug, Sean. OK, my brothers w- was serious in the streets. You know, I had a lot of friends who were I had to conform to the culture just to survive. And so but inside of me, I knew something was wrong. And when you give every boy who's locked up in there, when I gave them opportunity to express what was it that caused you to make this decision to get in here? It was because they could not express how they really was feeling, man. And so they end up going towards the leaning towards a culture that basically is systematically designed to get them in there. And so I have to allow at the beginning of all of our training sessions in the cave, I allow them a moment where they can tell me how they feel, why they feel. And is it legitimate to is the emotion legitimate or illegitimate? Should we cast it away? And then what are we going to do about it moving forward? Those skills I'm training them are the same skills you need when you get uh, pulled over by the police, you get accused for something in school, whatever. You got to be able to respond and express your emotions without allowing them to control you. And what has happened in the culture, like you and I both know, because we produce hip hop music. Basically, it, it, it's 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 like they're, all it is is a soundtrack to what they're experiencing. That's it. That's it. Literally. That's all it is. Yeah. But if you get with any, I mean, a real gangbanger, he doesn't want to live that way. No. <laughs> Facts. They don't want to live that way, man. I've talked to them and they're crying and they're, I mean, tears coming out their eyes. Mr. Wilson, no one ever gave me time to really express this. And they get mad because they feel like they've been played. But the problem is they have not been allowed to be human. And that's where brothers like me and you and Chris and Cliff and others have to stand up and show them what it means, you know, to be a, a, a comprehensive man, you know. Um, you know, and, and, and that's what's the key is, you know, to be courageous, but also compassionate, to be strong but sensitive. You know, someone who can live fearlessly from their heart instead of their hurt. And, and that's what, you know, when the boys get the, when they get to see that, Sean, we don't need to say nothing else. And so um, that's that's my desire is to, is to be what I didn't see. I'm tired of talking, brother. And uh, that's that's what I want young men to see. You know, um, you know, the, man, I'm telling you, man, you, we, we we emulated those who were prominent in our communities. What if we saw uh, uh, just say 60 percent of the men in our community were comprehensive? 
committed to their wives, committed to their children, committed to social change, committed to justice, committed to serving Christ. You can't tell me the community wouldn't change. Oh, it would cause change, most definitely. Yes. Most definitely. And so, and, and that's why, you know, um, I, I, I literally, you know, when, when God called me to, to write Cry Like a Man, you know, I said, you know, I'm going to be very transparent. I want them to know about my failures, my struggles and everything. So that a man, when he reads this book, he said, wait a minute. So you're telling me the way he felt is still, he's still a man feeling this way? Uh, the way he felt like he could have left his wife. Instead, he chose to fight through the emotion of fear and embarrassment. That's all it is, man. Many men want to save their families, dude, but they don't, you know, if you don't see other men fighting for their families, you won't. Yeah, we, we need a prototype. We need a prototype. We need a prototype. Well, in your book, the chapter, The Pressure of Promiscuity, I, I found it amusing because, I mean, if, if, you're, if, you're young, if, you're, if you're a black dude, man, we all been through this. Every black man's yeah. been through this, right? Why is conquering women such an important aspect of a young black's life? It, it seems to almost consume it. And, and not saying that in other cultures, um, young men aren't, um, you know, concerned about girls. You know, that's a natural thing. That, that's, a, you know, to, to, to be interested in girls. But in a young black man's life, man, it is, it, it is the first thing. It's the last thing. It's the middle thing. Why is that? Why, why is conquering women such an important aspect of a young black man's life? Hmm. I don't know if it's the... It's, well, if I, let me speak for myself. It was never really about conquering a woman it was about being accepted amongst my peers okay okay and so uh unfortunately you know during my era you know being a virgin was like an embarrassment um and so i was i i was like on a hunt to lose my virginity even though inside i didn't want to man but i never had men around me showing me like solomon was telling him sons his sons to, to, to never share the streams of water with anyone except your wife. Why have them flowing throughout the streets talking about your sperm? And so I never, you know, in me, Sean, I always, you know, and this is straight up, you, anybody hearing this that knows me, I never had like a, a track record of women. You know, I had a lot of women who liked me back in the day, but I always felt the value. I valued myself too much just to be just, having sex with women all the time. And the key thing is, is that men, especially young boys, believe that their identity is tied to how many women they can have sex with. For me, that was never a part of identifying who I was. I had to do it just so that I wouldn't be an outcast. Right. And I think that's what I was getting to. You were, you were feeling that pressure. Um, you know, you, I think you were talk, talking in the book about um, uh, your cousin Kevin and, 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 uh, yeah. you, you know, and, yeah. and, and just just that whole situation of, hey, man, did you get some, you know, just that. And, and, and you knew yeah. you knew what was right, right from wrong. You knew, you know, like you said, you valued yourself more. But, you know, th there is, you know, in, in a school, there is, you know, a, a few boys that, um, you know, all about women. And then, there, then there's the other boys that don't want to be called gay. You know what I'm saying? Right, um, exactly. and, and so they have to put on the facade or they have to, yeah, I get girls too, fam. I get girls too, homie. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I, find it, I find it amusing because in, you know, in one-on-one -on -one moments, of course, that whole thing is not there, you know? Right, but you have to, you know, what we, I'm, I'm focusing on, Sean, is, you know, it's interesting. We had a conversation with my uh, middle schoolers about what is a girlfriend, and because I found out from their parents that a couple of them had girlfriends. But in our, our in what we believe in our word that there's no such thing as a girlfriend. So we say a girlfriend in the cave of Adullam is a girl who is a friend. OK, the what you're looking for is called a fiance and a wife. And so I have to give my boys a clear understanding of what first what is sex? What was his intent from the beginning? So, a lot, first of all, I never was, uh, man, brother, I never had men that, that exist today, solid men of the most high, who could really tell me about uh, the, his intent for sex. And then how when Paul talks about when you lie with a prostitute, you become one flesh with her. 
And so then I tell a lot of men, I say, you ever wonder why if you're promiscuous and you have sex with another woman and another woman, you start thinking about the other woman while you're having sex with the woman you had, you haven't, well, you think, start thinking about the previous woman you had sex with while you're having sex with the woman you're dating now. You become one flesh. And so that's just one part of it, as we know biblically. But the point is, there's a spiritual connection, what happens when you penetrate a woman. So at the end of the day, do I want my vessel tainted by a lot of women? No. And so we have to, as men, Sean, we have to teach our boys what it means to be righteous. And then how it's really not respectful to even want our women the way that we do. And, and, and like, you know, we can't just blame our boys because a lot of you in the school systems, the girls have gotten more aggressive than the boys. But 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 that is a direct result. So we've always saw uh, the direct result of the father not being in the home, the effect on a boy. But now we finally are seeing the effect it has on girls, because when a girl doesn't have a man to tell her she's beautiful, you love. I, I love the way you, you carry yourself. You're, you're precious in my sight. She has to hear it, brother. So now you got a boy who doesn't have a father, doesn't know how to treat a woman, hasn't seen a man truly love his, his mom. All the men he see pretty much come in and out of her life and her legs. So what do you think he's going to do? And so as men, we have to step up and model what this looked like. You know, that's why I love the King movement. When I was there for the initiation of the brothers who, who came across the line, we have to, you know, I, I, I don't I'm, I tell my boys all the time, I'm not creating another generation of church boys. I don't care how much scripture, you know, no doubt. True. I want you to be able to live it. Yes. You yes, know, sir. and so for me, you know, they, they ask me, Sean, you know, how are you, you faithful to just miss Nicole, who's my wife? I'm like, that's 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 it. I desire not to worry about none of that, brother. I love her. But even deeper, they see my fear of the Lord. Because I don't care how much you love your wife. I've seen the most faithful men who are pastors and leaders. If you don't have the fear of the Lord, you can slip. Because your wife isn't going to be there when you're tempted by another woman. But the Holy Spirit in you will let you know you're in danger. But if you don't have the fear of the Lord in you, that's why I love Eshan Bergen in one of his songs was about the fear of the Lord. What You're done, man. And so, you know, my, you know, Sean, I mean... It all stems back to our culture. We have to, like Christ did, he, he penetrated a culture and challenged it. So we have to challenge what's being called norm and shed light on it so that people can see the evil in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, man, let's switch gears just a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I, I got a whole bunch of questions here, but I'm not going to keep you here all day. Um, tell me about initially your DJing and production career. I, I found when, when this started to open up in the book, I was like, huh? You know, uh, this was, this was interesting Produ producing a track for Chris Webber. And I was like, huh? Okay. So tell me a little about the DJ and production career. Well, you know, um, coming up, you know, I, uh, it was funny, you know, I knew I was never going to college, you know, okay, okay. as soon as I got to senior year, cause I, 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 I love DJing. It was a way for me to, um, Get the money, get the girls, the clothes, and everything without having to sell drugs. Okay, no doubt. I tried selling drugs; it didn't work. Okay, okay. so <laughs> it was another way out. Okay, uh -huh. um, but then I became very good at it, mm. and I desired to be one of the best at it. And so, actually, um, I also uh, working on Chris Weber project. I was able to produce songs for Corrupt, who was with the Dog right. Pound, and no he doubt. and I yep. became friends, and then uh, Red Man as well. Wow! And so um, my transition from that. Um, because even when I had given my life to Christ, I was still producing those songs because, again, I, I knew scripture, but my desire was stronger than God's will for my life. And so I had two masters, you know, um, I, I found myself saying, well, hey, if no one's around this group, how can you reach them? But I quickly learned that they didn't respect the fact that I made beats and they were spitting poison over it. Corrupt called me, man. I never forgot this brother, man. Was a, a, a just a, a good brother to be around the time. You know, you saw the gangster. He was he was that. You know but what? He, when he and I would talk, yes. I, I saw an interview with Corrupt on the Breakfast Club. I really like that cat, man. He just seems like an authentic, honest dude. 
Listen, dude, that brother called me one Christmas morning when I told him, you know, and, and, and he never knew this side of me. I said, I'm stepping away from music because I, I got to live for the Lord only. He's, he respected that, man. And, you know, I, 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 so I had to, I literally, Sean, from that moment on, I stopped producing any music for all my friends who, who rapped uh, secular, you know, who pr promoted the things that I was against. And so one day, Kurop and I were talking. He says, well, Jay, you know, he called me Magi. He says, Madge, you know, but you're, you're just making the beat. I said, well, yeah, okay, let's put it this way. If a, the beat was the gun, your, uh, your lyrics are the, trick, are the bullets. When they come together, the trigger gets pulled and it kills another mind. And so I literally was the underscore for what I hated. I was orchestrating the soundtrack for what I was against. And I had to make a decision, like, I can't do it anymore. But as a result, all of my friends who were in it respected me for it. To this day, we love each other. You know, we care for each other. But I had to make a stance there. And then from there, I didn't know it was a such thing as Christian hip-hop. And the first group I ever heard was the Cross Movement. Then after that, it was Corey Ray and Precise. Just like then me. I started producing yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. And then I started producing music uh with Christ at the center of it. And then I found a great piece because here it is now. I'm creating the theme for what I live my life by. And kids were literally giving their lives over to the most high at our concerts and our gatherings. Uh, we would go in the communities and set up uh speakers and start rapping the gospel, man, and being there for them. And that's of our era, Sean, you know. And so that's how um, I came into hip-hop. And then what was interesting, I had to leave hip-hop to really do what I'm doing now. Um, I, I, I still, you know, we got to be so careful because our desires are still so close to the flesh. We have to be very careful. So I still, I I still want to use this for you. But it, at the same time, somewhere inside of me, I still wanted to be that platinum producer recognized by Dr. Dre. And so that's what the most I had to purge out of me. And I was telling one, I was on this TV show, and they said, well, you know, did you think all of this would happen with the viral video and everything? I said, no. I said, this was never something I desired to do. However, but once I surrendered my dream to his will, here it is, the people I always wanted to meet, they're contacting me on a direct message on Instagram. They're reaching out to me because it was always bigger than me creating something. They needed what was in me, and that was God's spirit. And so it, it was so much bigger than music. I never thought I would have an academy or a, a nonprofit, the Union which Academy is under, that could help youth and families. I never wanted to do that, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> but when I, I surrendered, when I was broken and I surrendered my life to him, I made, with, together with our entire team, I made a greater impact than my entire life trying to make music within 15 years of this organization, we've impacted over 10,000 youth and families. So crazy. And, and I, and, and I, and I think, you know, um, you know, as you, you know, when you got saved and I, and I want to go back and talk a little bit about your, you know, your salvation experience and, and really the act, the, the accident that you had at, um, at your job that really kind of uh, pushed that forward, but you created the union you did the her project, so I'm I'm reading the book and I'm like the union, I know the union. Then I'm like the her project, and then I'm like this cat did stuff on the truth, you know what I'm saying the yeah. truth album, and I think you did some stuff on on uh, Ambassador's Christology album as well. Yes, I sure did. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So I was yeah, like, so we started I, as a record. <laughs> we started as a record label. Yeah. But we couldn't. You know, uh, Lecrae had a song called "When the Music Stops," and before he even put it out. I saw we wasn't making the impact when the music stopped. Because I have kids I would give these CDs to. They say, I love your music, Mr. Wilson, but my father is beating my mom at home. And I can't sleep. I got to sleep outside at night. So that's when, in 2005, I went after our nonprofit status. And from there, we haven't looked back ever since. Wow. That's, that's just amazing. Well, I'll I, I, I tell you what. I, I found that as I read that, I was like, Man, this this cat has been all over the place. Um, from 
from secular hip hop to Christian hip hop, just the experiences and and listeners, trust me, when I say we are touching a fraction of this book, um, you know, I didn't I didn't talk about your brother Keith, um, which which is a whole nother story. I I didn't I, I, I didn't talk. Well, well, I I I'm, I want to try to you know keep it as concise as possible. I got a couple of more questions, but but let's let's talk about that. How how did your brother Keith, um, who you know was on your dad's side and and you met him later in life, t- tell us about that and, and and his influence on on you. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, and um, my brother Keith, we were actually kept apart for so long because of. Um, again, when my mother divorced my father, you know, rumored in the streets was that it was because of his affair with my brother Keith's mother. And so my father couldn't bring Keith up and my mother never wanted me to know about him because she didn't want me to look different than my father. It wasn't until I was 17 years old that I reconnect with my brother. Um, his influence was on me, was heavy on me because, again, you talk in the 90s, you know, to be a, uh, a brother of a millionaire drug dealer. I mean, like, a legitimate millionaire, not not just any, I mean, like, $100,000 PAJ watches, okay? Um, I was heavily influenced. But things started to change when I really saw that real, the real side of that lifestyle. And when he was murdered, um, it, it took a big chunk out of me because here it is, another man I looked up to is gone out of my life. But I, uh, I'm thankful, and I learned something from him. At the end of the chapter, I talk about he had race cars, and he would race uh, professionally, you know, uh, $300,000 race cars. And one of them said on the back, if it's God's will, I will. And I said, wait a minute. And I wasn't a believer then. I said, well, wait a minute. How you have that on the plate, and I know what you do for a living? And he says, man, all I can do is try. And so when I, I sat back and thought about that, I'm like, man, and today I wish I would have had the knowledge of who I am and who I am in Christ more importantly then so that I could have probably pulled him away from that lifestyle. Because I was always begging him, could you get out, man? Can you get out? He said, what else am I going to do, Jay? And the reason he went to the streets, Sean, he asked my father for some money just to buy some gym shoes. They were called Adidas Top Tens. I think they were like $70 then. My father gave him $15. And he said, you know, never again will I ask him for anything. And he started selling drugs. And um, so that was a very tough time in my life. And, you know, I'm not, I know I'm not the only one with a brother like that, uh, a person who lost their brother to crime who was in the street life. Um, but at the end of the day, it was, it was a lack of a man there because he wanted my father. He wanted uh, a man to guide him. But, you know, again, when you read the story of my life, my father needed affirmation. You know, he had a lot of anger inside. So I tell all the time, a lot of men beat themselves up about the fathers they're not. I said, brother, truthfully, if you're a black father, you're probably just two generations away from slavery. What do you know what it means to be a father, let alone a man? And so... um, you know, you know. Again, we have a, a lot of work to do. But again, Sean, if we don't change the culture, brother, you know, I call it. You know, we're so busy cutting off branches instead of uprooting the tree, um, and that's what we have to start doing. Let's let's shift a, another gear, and um, you know, after you got saved, um, you uh, well, you you met your wife. No, you, no, you met your wife before you got saved. Um, Nicole, I heard, I heard you talk about her earlier and it's, it's funny, um, just kind of side note, um, because you guys had a baby, um, Alexis. Uh, and so when I got the email from Alexis, I was like, that's the Alexis from the book. So it, it was, it was just kind of, it, it was kind of a, a, a funny moment. Cause I, I remember reading in the book and then you I, I was like that, that's, that's his daughter right there. That's just, it's just crazy. I don't, I don't know. Just, just don't mind me. So anyway, um, so you and your wife um, have a child before you get married and um, you guys get married and you, you know, you're, you're facing some, some rocky times. And at one point you guys are attending two different churches. She's attending her, her dad's church. Um, you're attending another church. Um, do you think that it's healthy for a family uh, for the husband and wife to attend 
two different churches and what advice could you give listeners in the situation? And I ask you this question because I have um, good friends and I know of good people um, who are in this very situation. And so can you tell us maybe some of the effects it had on your family and what advice you, could you give to them? Mm, wow. Well, well, first of all, you know, biblically, it's unbiblical for a wife to be separate from her husband once they become one. Because um, it's written that, you know, husband and wife will leave mother and father and become one. And so what it did to our, our household, it was almost like I felt like I was being disrespected every Sunday. And then it birthed so much anger and resentment in our home, man. I mean, and then my father-in-law, who I love dearly, who he typically stays out of his daughter's business. <laughs> you know, that's just how he, he is and he operates. Um, he never said anything about, hey, Nicole, you should be at the church with your husband. And I'm thinking it's because he just wanted his daughters there. But it's the fact that, hey, you, she got to make her own decision. But in my book, I say, you know, I wish he would have just said, hey, you're being unbiblical. Follow your husband. But he never did that because he was the type of man where, you know, his daughters are grown. He he never really got in their business like that. But I, but I'm thinking it's a deliberate attempt to keep his daughters at church with him. And so that caused resentment between me and him, you know, it, well, not between me and him because he didn't even know it was me. And. But my father-in-law, that wasn't his heart or his desire, but it was just my my wife was just really connected because that's her family. Literally, her whole family was there. And so it caused I just felt that every Sunday she would go and not be with me. I was being disrespected or she didn't respect my leadership or the classic. I'm not the priest of my home. And I, I would love to just jump on that real quick, because a lot of times as men, we become slaves to alliterations, you know, uh, the most popular one was that with a priest, provider, and protector. And when you really look at biblically, and then under the new covenant, we're all royal priesthood. And so we, you know, it was a great motivational tactic, but at the end of the day, it put more pressure on men. And so our wives have to walk out their own salvation with fear and trembling, just like we do. And so at the end of the day, we're both royal priests. The second piece are we to protect it, Sean? You and I, we know, we've seen men, we heard about men being tied up and their whole houses being uh, ransacked. We know if without the spirit of the Lord, we're going to lose. You know, the watchman watches in vain. There's scriptures all about it. And the provider, Jehovah Jireh. And so at the end of the day, as a man, that was a very rough period in my time because so much was identified with me being a leader the priest, the provider, and the protector. And so when my wife wasn't falling in line with that, it just caused so much conflict. And Sean, honestly, like I wrote about in my book, people see the marriage now, it's beautiful. But in 2014, 15, we were considering getting separated because no infidelity, no gambling issues, anything like that, just so much negative talk and bad memories. And so... To answer the question, if you're married and you're a woman, my, if my wife was on the phone, she'd tell you. It wasn't until we lost our last child to miscarriage before we had our son, Jason, that the Holy Spirit had told her, you need to be at Rosedale with your father, which, with your husband, which was my church. And that was because the, the church would give us, they, whoever was experiencing like, uh, you know, the death of a loved one or a new baby or whatever, celebrate, celebration of whatever, or whatever, they would bring food by and that's what had happened. And God used that moment to to, uh, um, I guess, prick my wife's heart. Because my wife always if you meet my wife, she loves me. She I could the union what it is today. She's a major part in that. The nonprofit, it wouldn't exist without her being there. It wasn't it wasn't the fact that she didn't want to be with me. I did not know how to really articulate how much it hurt me that she would not be with me at where I fellowshiped. So it, it came off as anger or you're, you're uh, pissing me off. I hope that I can say that on your show. I, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Profanity, Go ahead, man. But yeah, you're good. Yeah, yeah, and so you're pissing me off instead of saying, you hurt me. This is hurting me so bad. Now you got a different conversation with your wife. But if we're coming at them uh, uh, hostile and angry and you're not submitting to my authority, no one comes to the father because of his wrath. 
They come, we come to him because of his love and the fact that he can love us when we're unlovable. And so as a husband, I failed miserably in communicating how that hurt me. I communicated how it enraged me. And the Holy Spirit had to step in because without him, I don't know what would have happened. So I would tell if you're married, you're a woman. I wish my wife could speak to this because I really believe what the scriptures uh, testify about women teaching women. She would tell the women, follow your husband, submit, leave and cleave. And I tell the men, communicate from your heart, brothers, not so much of the feeling. Let her know how you really feel. And then now you're in a different area. See, we got to remember that the Most High gave Adam a responsibility, but he gave Eve a relationship. So we had to tend the garden, but she was meant to help us. And so you got a, 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 a human who's centered around loving you. I mean, if you got a good wife, every man who knows, they know this. I have a great wife. And it's her, she is centered around loving me. And as a man, you that's a great responsibility that you do not shatter that. And so as a man, we just don't know how to communicate it because of the, the I call them misleading mantras. You know, if she doesn't submit to your so-called priesthood, why not? You know, and, 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 and you know, again, we do have both husband and women who can be have a rebellious spirit, but at the end of the day, if you married a good husband and a good wife, we both have to have what's called compassionate communication instead of uh, judging with spirit of condemnation and really hear each other out. And that's why Sean is so important, brother, for us as men and husbands to be able to uh, 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 express the real way we feel about our wives. When we can do that, you haven't even seen what a marriage can be like. I have men that can't even cry to their wives, brother. I can literally cry in front of my wife. That's how free I am with her. Because I can express it. And now, this is deep. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, when I lost my mother, Sean, in the book, it hit me. God says, I never meant for man to ever live without a nurturing love of a mother. Of a mother. Why do you think you hear over and over men saying, my wife did this without her, I wouldn't be here. She taught me how to do this and taught me how to do that. That sounds like your mother. But if we do not know how to express the need for their nurturing, they can't even operate in what God has already given them. If we think we're Superman wearing a cape that's strangling us, if you got a cape on, everyone will always think you're a superhero. But if your wife never knows you're hurting, you're grieving, or you feel worried about certain things. Of course, we, we don't want to, to, to put things on them more than they can handle. But our women are strong, man. And so the majority of the conflict in our homes is a lack of communication. And we're not communicating from the way we really feel. It's always we're trying to uh, uh, predict the intention or we feel that their intention was wrong. And so with my wife and I, the reason we don't keep if we have a disagreement, it's over by the end of the day or within an hour or so because we know the intent for each other is to love each other. Let's let, and I want to I want to end um, with this last question. And it, it, it really kind of you, you're really already you're already there. You're already in the water already. And in, in the book, you talk about these two crying experiences. I, I think they were kind of pivotal from what I gathered. You talk about the experience of you crying in front of your wife for the first time. Um, and then you talk about crying over your dear friend, Big D. Um, why is crying necessary for a man? Well, first off, it's been proven that it releases stress hormones from the body. So when we cry, uh, what's called reflex tears, when something gets in our eyes, you know, it's 98% water. But when we cry from emotional pain, it's 98, not only 98% water, but it also releases stress hormones. And so when we don't cry, we're actually backed up. And so why do you think when you, when you cry, you typically feel better when you're finished? Because you've just released stress out of your body. And so that's why it's imperative for a man to be human. 
and it's okay for you to cry. And so uh, when my best friend Daryl died at his funeral, I'm back in the room with the pastors because I had to speak at his funeral. I looked at my pastor at the time. I said, you know, I feel like crying. And he looked at me. He says, well, cry. That was the first time a man ever gave me permission to cry. And it, it, Sean, it liberated me, man, from misconstrued masculinity. I was finally free to love from my heart, man. I was finally free to express the real me, man. So, so many men, like I tell them all the time, I said, look, you may not cry physical tears, but you're crying. They said, what do you mean? I said, you're addicted to porn. You're, you're, you have multiple women uh, outside of marriage. Uh, I uh, have kids in school. I said, you're crying. Your grades are, are, are plummeting because you can't talk to anyone about what's going on. So as men, we cry in different ways. Why do you think we commit suicide more than our women? You know, uh, you know because we, we need an emotional enema to, to flush all of this, the years of trauma and emotional pain, the things that we've held in so long. And then in worship on a spiritual level, brother, if you can't be emotional, why do you think men don't even worship hardly in church? So could we feel it's what women do? But we know the greatest warrior in the Bible, in my eyes, was David. This brother was so bad that the, the uh, that Jesus said, I'm choosing your lineage to come behind you. I'm the son of David. That's like Jesus telling you, Sean, I'm the son of Sean. Come on, how, how bad is that? But because David knew how to express his emotions. And as a man, once we get there, you still, you know, like I say, you know, be courageous, but be compassionate, be strong, but sensitive. And my, the word I use, I keep drilling it over and over into the men that I work with. You want to become comprehensive. Uh, when I trained in one art under uh, instructor Kajana, he, he asked us one day, so imagine being in the heart of Detroit uh, brothers in this dojo, everyone hard, apparent. It looks, everyone, it appears to be hard. He says, who are you? Brothers were saying, you know, I'm a warrior. I'm a, I, I take care of the community. You know, blah, you can name over and over again. It was giving these, all these adjectives. And he laughed. He says, the next time someone asks you that, he says, stop limiting yourself. I want you to say you're anything and everything you have to be at any given moment. That's comprehensive. You know, and that's what I, my mission is for men, because when I say regardless of ethnicity, we're hurting, man. And I'm thankful now that the Most High is tilling the hearts of men, breaking the rough soil up so that his seeds of healing can penetrate. But we just got to be willing to do the hard work. And I always say we want to be hard, but we're scared to do what's really hard. And that's be emotional. Man, well, look, this um, this has been rich, Jason. This has been um, amazing. Um, again, the book, absolutely fantastic. It chock, just chock full of just uh, just stories and just, um, you know, things that make you read a chapter and just stop for a second before you move on to the next. Um, so I so appreciate you. Tell us a little bit about. Um, before we go, tell us a little bit about the kata, uh, the K. Am I pronouncing it right? I, I know it's the. That's that's true. You know, the, the kata is just an acronym for the Cave of Adullam Transformational Training Academy. Um, it basically is is centered around the cave where David and his men uh, ran to, where David ran to, and the other men when they heard he was there, the other four hundred men came to him and who were distressed, in debt, and discontented. But these same men left, being called mighty men of valor. And so that's what we do today in the cave. Our mission is basically to teach, train, and transform uninitiated boys into comprehensive men of the Most High, uh, men who are, of course, physically conscious, mentally astute, and spiritually strong enough to navigate through the pressures of this world, but without succumbing to their negative emotions. And so um, that academy is under our nonprofit called The Union. And, um, and so that's where, where, where uh, God has me right now. And um, I'm just really excited about the future of helping boys and men become comprehensive. So if people want to donate to the Cado, if they want to reach out to you, um, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe get the book and, you know, give us some, some mm -hmm. socials and some, some ways okay. that they can contact you. Great. If you would like to donate to the Cado, 
Um, the website is give to the future.com, uh, give to the future.com. If you'd like to follow me on social media, my handle is Mr. Jason O. Wilson, Mr. Jason O. O is for my middle name, Oliver Wilson. And, um, um, if you'd like to follow, um, what our organization is called the union, um, it's simply www.theunion.com. Org and it's the word union, but with the letter Y in front of it for youth. And there they can learn more about the work we're doing in the city if they'd like to volunteer or, you know, I guess donate to the organization as a whole. We truly appreciate it. We just uh, we're closing now on the building. We've been raising money for now, I believe, almost two years. And so this will allow us to open up enrollment to over 400 boys who are on the waiting list for the cave of Adela. Wow. Awesome. Well, Jason, man, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you today, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean, for all that you've done. I mean, I remember you back in uh, Christian hip hop and your voice. You were always uh, one of my favorites, man. And um, thank you for, you know, all that you're doing with the King Movement. And um, again, you know, reach out to me. I'm glad we connected through this um, medium here. But I would like to, you know, definitely stay in touch with you, brother. And uh, much props to the King Movement and my brother, Chris. Thanks for listening to the King Talks podcast. Be sure to check us out at kingmovement.com. Also, you can find the King Talks podcast on any of your favorite podcast websites or apps. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I'm your host, Sean Slaughter. We out. Brought the kings with me on this one. It's a movement. Yeah. I had a dream. I saw black slaves in 2018. Pulling them big king with a crown in the middle. Looking like tug of war. I guess they forgot the inheritance of the Lord. Dying over streets when God gave him the earth. It's all in the Bible, just to your research. White man's religion, that's just fake news. The cross hit Africa for Europe, even new. This ain't black versus white, this is dark versus light. But racism might distract you from the Christ on sight. So here's the Visine, me and my team. Dark world, but we flipping on a high beam king. Here's for the knowledge, I is to inspire. In for the nurture, the G is to grow higher. Jesus lit the match, so we all on fire. You see your crown under your tire, know you looking at a fighter. My people, my people.